It's closing time in the NBA. Three closeout opportunities and three closeouts and a historic performance from Chris Paul. Who's moving on and how will the Suns benefit from a difficult Pelicans test? We've got all of that and more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday on Locked on NBA, your daily podcast on the NBA. However, you may be tuning in YouTube, Odyssey, or wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. I'm Wes Goldberg here with Adam Mares. The 76ers avoid a disaster and the Mavericks move on. But let's start in New Orleans. The number one seeded Suns entered the night with a chance to close out the pesky Pelicans, but trailed by double digits in the third quarter before Chris Paul delivered one of the finest shooting performances <laughs> of his Hall of Fame career. Chris Paul scored 13 points in the third to bring the Suns back and made NBA playoff history as he became the first ever player to make 14 of 14 shots on his way to 33 points. His biggest shot came with 28 seconds left. That classic 10-foot pull-up yeah. jumper from the right block, it's become his signature shot, and that <laughs> put the Pelicans away. Worth noting that Devin Booker played his first game after missing the last three and a half with a hamstring injury. Uh, he was still clearly dealing with that uh, and the lingering effects of that injury. He finished with just 13 points, but did make a crucial three-pointer with yes, 142 left in the game. That gave the Suns the lead for good. But Adam, what can you say about Chris Paul's performance? Uh, it was perfect. I mean, literally <laughs> perfect. 14 of 14 is just insane. Um, and a lot of these were good makes. And then at the end, you kept thinking like, oh, he's going to miss one of these. He's going to miss one. And he had two or three shots in a row that kind of rattled in. It looked mm -hmm. like they were going to bounce out. But it was just his day, man. Uh, somebody above was looking out for Chris Paul. He could not miss in this one. And as you mentioned, <laughs> he's been doing this for how many seasons now? Getting to that right uh, elbow, just driving right and getting to that mid-range zone and pulling up to, to close games. And it's one of those ones where everybody knows it's coming and they still can't stop it. Um, an all-timer from him to close the door on what I thought was a really, really great Pelicans run that had they gotten this game, game seven to me would have been a toss-up game. So this was a right? very important closeout uh, job by Chris Paul. Just unbelievable performance from Chris Paul. I mean, the last three closeout games he's done, it's been classic performances in each of these games. Um, he's had one kind of stinker, in the series, but otherwise it's been an awesome series for Chris Paul. Right. Um, and you're, I don't know how he keeps getting to that spot. Everybody knows it's coming. The Pelicans have obviously scouted the Suns really well. Willie green is the head coach. He knows Chris Paul as well as anybody. And there's just nothing you can do. He gets the defender on his hip, turns that hip into getting the defender on his back, and then just kind of scoots his way into that little right elbow area and hits that shot every time. It kind of clanged around three or four times and finally <laughs> fell through. And it almost right, reminded it just, me of the Kawhi shot against Toronto a couple a years bit. back where it bounces straight up, and you're like, is that going to drop? And it did. So the Suns are going to play the Mavericks in the next round. Um, before and, we get there, I want to make one quick note, though, on, on, before oh. we get there. Just, you know, Jose Alvarado obviously has really made a name for himself over these last couple of months and into this playoffs, mm -hmm. including going toe-to-toe -to -toe here. I thought one of the big differences between the last game, which, as you mentioned, was a – a, a really bad Chris Paul game to this one, which was obviously a phenomenal bounce back. Obviously the addition of Devin Booker provided a little bit more spacing, but I think more importantly, Alvarado had been getting into him, pressuring him a full court, just trying to wear him down. And I think it had a real effect on him in this game. I thought Phoenix did a better job of getting him off ball from mm -hmm. bringing the ball up the court so that he, it's just conserves yeah. some energy. Then you can run the half court show. And I thought, it was just such a difference between all that extra work he had to do, taking that off his plate, it really worked out. I actually thought Cam Johnson was really big for them in the fourth quarter, and he was one of the guys that they would bring the ball up because right. um, I don't know why. He was just always sort of the free man to, to kind of bring the ball up. You're absolutely he's, right. He's good, man. Like He's Cam, really good. Cam Johnson is such a funny guy. Like He only played 24 minutes tonight. I, I mean, I don't know what he is, the sixth, seventh, eighth best player. I think he's probably sixth or seventh best player on that team. Easily the best seventh best player in, uh, like in the playoffs. That's a really good player to have that deep into your rotation. Um, it, it speaks to how deep the Suns are and just their overall strength. Obviously, you're getting Hall of Fame stuff from Chris Paul. You yeah. mentioned the the how Alvarado was just bugging him all series, right? And, and we kind of yeah. saw those frustrations boil over in the in the previous game. And you could you just know Chris Paul was just like, I'm not letting that happen again. 
I'm coming out. And he probably didn't say, I'm going to go 14 of 14 for 33 points, but he he decided that he was going to have a better game. And, and that's exactly what happened. But yeah, they had so many options. Devin Booker being back is obviously very helpful. Um, and, and, you know, I thought we saw the strength of Phoenix uh, just take over. A, Chris yeah. Paul, B, their depth yeah. um, tonight. And, you know, they, you know, we always talk about, hey, if you can kind of get one big test early in the playoffs, that almost springboards you uh, for a long playoff run, right? And I kind of think the Pelican series was just, nobody expected it out of yeah. a 1 8 series, but it really did test them, right? Like if Chris Paul now has this resolve going forward and Devin Booker's injury, the worst of his injuries in the, in the past, and you're getting like, Big time stuff from DeAndre Ayton, who's hitting those floaters and, and just being such an outlet for them on offense in the way that he didn't really have to be last year. Um, you know, this could be the series that springboards Phoenix. Not that they needed it, but, you know, there's there's competition. The Mavericks are coming up in the next round. It could be the Warriors in the right. Eastern Conference or in the Western Conference Finals. Like, this could be a really important thing for them. The one thing I'll say about that is if you look at the path that they likely have to the finals, it would be obviously this one, and then you go through Dallas and Golden State. All three of those teams are so wildly different that I wonder, like, you know, you had to play against some guys that were young, fresh, energetic, a little bit chaotic. And even on the other end of the court, guys that are just making some really tough shots, yeah. um, you know, some really good one-on-one -on -one shot makers. You go to this next series and it's going to be Luka Doncic, Shayla Brunson, spread pick and roll, five out, a lot of just just a completely different look. Um, so I do think that there's something to the intensity and even just the adversity of losing Booker that, you know, Phoenix is hardened through this experience and, and probably a little bit tougher because of it, but right. the challenge becomes so wildly different that it's almost like a whole new level, a whole new set of tests. Can we talk a little bit about the Pelicans? Um, sure. because Willie Green, their head coach, emotional after the game, yeah. very visibly emotional, especially as he was congratulating Chris Paul on the win. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot, and obviously this one hurts, but a uh, lot to be proud of if you're the Pelicans and if you're a Pelicans fan, right? A lot to be excited about with these youngsters, Alvarado, your man, Herb Jones. Uh, you're getting Zion Williamson back next season, potentially. Like, right. a lot of good stuff coming out of this series if you're a Pelicans fan. I mean, even Trey Murphy, if we want to keep going down the yeah. list of, of, like, promising young players. Um, and you know who had a Jackson sneaky, Hayes showing flashes. Yeah, like Jackson Hayes for sure. But you know who had a sneaky good series? And a guy that I think has been a good pickup for them, a good find, has been Larry Nance Jr. Yeah. Uh, tonight he gets 15 points, 8 rebounds. And he just – he's one of those guys who has looked good at, at times in Cleveland and then not looked so good. Went to Portland. Obviously, that was a disaster of an experience for everybody. Nobody looked good out there. And you wonder, like, is this guy actually have value? What is he? He was almost a throw-in. And now you see him out here, and he's completely reinvigorated, and his skill set is much needed and much appreciated for that team. So uh, I'm with you. Willie Green's a great coach. What they have done in one – if you just think back to where they were at the start of this season, when they had that horrible start, when the Zion stuff, you know – is he even going to play? He looks terrible. He's overweight. And David Griffin, these reports come out about him. Um, they were in a really bad, really, really bad situation, about as bad as any team in the NBA. And for them to go to that, to the feel-good story of the NBA this season, that's just a heck of a turnaround. And I credit, obviously, the young players, but I credit Willie Green as the captain of that turnaround. Yeah, and getting C.J. McCollum, whose name we haven't even said yet, uh, at the yeah. deadline was huge. You know, you get a guy who's so respected in the NBA and guys, you know, in the NBA really root for him and want to play with him. Um, and to your point, you know, early in the season it was, you know, how long is Zion for New Orleans? And now the entire <laughs> vibe around the organization is so much different, so much more positive that I don't if, – if Zion was going to demand a trade, that whatever percentage that was – going to happen is probably less now than it was then I, I if that makes any sense like now there's a real sense of okay we're building something here zion williamson completely engaged on the sideline right yeah. with with the team during the playoffs and definitely um and and from all the reports he's really getting along with his teammates and really loves cj and all that stuff like that's that's good news right you don't want to lose zion williamson you add him to the mix next year larry nance to your point is a really complimentary piece next to him in that front court uh, there's just a lot to like. There's a lot to like about what the Pelicans are building. If you go all the way back to November 22nd, they were three and 16, three <laughs> wins, 16 losses. So for them to go to that, that was the bottom. That's where they bottomed out. But to go from that to pushing the Western Conference uh, defending champs to a game six and to make Chris Paul have to be perfect from the field to knock you out. 
That's a heck of a turnaround, man. Best story in the NBA this year. Yep. Um, the Suns are going to play the Mavericks in the next round. They learned that tonight in a thrilling win for the Mavericks in Utah. We'll talk about that next, but first. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Built Bar is truly a standout among protein bars with its exceptional nutritional profile and so many delicious flavors. Built Bar is the pro favorite protein bar of many discerning fitness trainers and fitness enthusiasts alike. All Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. They taste better than your current protein bar, and they're perfect for an after-workout snack or some needed energy throughout a day. Built Bars are low in calories and carbs. They're high in fiber. They are packed with protein. All you got to do is look at the macros. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to most protein bars, and Built Bars are a clear winner. Plus, they come in great flavors, mint brownie, raspberry, salted caramel, cookies and cream, and so much more. They're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. And if you haven't tried the Puffs, then you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best-tasting products. Puffs are the first-ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy and covered in 100% real chocolate. They come in churro, coconut marshmallow, and banana cream pie flavors. Here's the offer. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off on your order. Again, promo code LOCKED1515 for 15% off at Built.com. Thank you for making Locked On NBA your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. The Mavericks will move on to the second round after beating the Jazz 98-96. to The Mavericks came back from 12 points down and outscored the Jazz 36-19 to in the third quarter. Mm. The game was still close until the very yeah. end. The Mavs led by eight in the fourth, but the Jazz battled back and Bojan Bogdanovic's three tied the game at 94 with two and a half minutes to go. But then Luka Doncic found Jalen Brunson to go back up by three. Rudy Gobert's layup cut the lead to one. The Jazz get a stop, and they had a chance to take the lead. But Mike Conley gets stuck on a drive, oh picks gosh. up his dribble, and travels. Oh, this was rough. It was a rough. That was rough. Uh, still, the Jazz had one more chance. After Jalen Brunson splits his free throws, the Mavs led by two, and Bojan Bogdanovic again. Gets open. This time, wide open. Wide open. Could not stress that enough. Wide open. Has the entire side of the floor just to himself. <laughs> out of Coming out of the timeout. Had time to set his feet, measure the shot. But he misses, Adam. He somehow misses that shot. The Mavs hold on. They will face the Suns in the next round. Doncic and Brunson each finished with 24 points as Doncic advance, uh, advances past the first round. For the first time in his career, Adam, an exciting end to the game and one that has to sting for the Jazz. I, it was exciting in that it was close. I got to say, the fourth quarter, I thought both teams were kind of disappointing. <laughs> both <laughs> teams, they, they had their moments in this where they where both teams looked good. But the fourth quarter, I just thought both of them down the stretch made some bad plays, missed some big shots. And it was almost a story of missed opportunities rather than you know taking advantage of opportunities. But yeah, you tip your hat to this Dallas Mavericks team that – Played without Luka Doncic for a while. Jalen Brunson had an incredible playoff runs. Even mm -hmm. tonight, tied for leading scorer with 24 points. Um, this Mavs team just has this identity of this spread. I don't know if it's going to take them all the way to the finals or even Western Conference finals, but they really have a refined style of spreading you out, playing at their pace, and then just breaking you down off the dribble that, unfortunately for Utah, I, I want to say that they just get bad luck and that they keep matching up with this teams. But honestly, at this point, I think everybody, including the Utah Jazz, feel it was inevitable that they would run into somebody that can stretch him out this thinly. And that's exactly what Dallas did. I mean, it happens to the Jazz every single playoffs, doesn't it? And it just, it, it feels we, we could talk about Utah here in a bit. But um, yeah, Dallas going with like Dorian Finney Smith at the five lineups, Maxi Cleaver <laughs> having great uh, runs for them yeah. in, in certain lineups during this. Uh, series um, and having Luca back with whatever like linebacker neck roll thing that he had tonight that I don't know what was going on with that but um, you know he looks he looked good uh, not you know not top notch Luca but he hit some big threes down the stretch um, he's obviously healthy and everything runs through him but then you're getting really great contributions for Jalen Brunson Spencer Dinwiddie can do stuff for them um, yeah I, I don't know if it'll be a situation where they can actually challenge Phoenix. I actually think there's a case to be made that the Pelicans are a worse matchup for Phoenix than Dallas is, despite the fact that Dallas has, you know, the superior player versus the Pelicans. But, right. um, you know, 
they made it out of the series and and, and it was going to be a tough one without Luca for those many for that many games and you know they they avoided a game 7 here I think what's one of the things that's interesting to me is you watch the Mavs and how they performed without Luca early on and where they were impressive. In particular, I mean, Jalen Brunson, just his ability to sort of become the lead guy, the lead ball yeah. handler, lead, lead creator, lead scorer, all of those things was so great. I thought when Luca came back, the blending, I mean, obviously Luca's so great. He's the greatest player on that team. He might be the best player left in the Western Conference. I mean, that we could have a real discussion about that. Him, Steph Curry, Chris Paul, you could, yeah. Devin Booker, there's some good ones left. But um, his uh, he takes up so much of the possession, so many of the possessions, that I almost feel like they haven't quite fully figured out how to blend Jalen Brunson. I almost left some these last two games thinking they could have gone to Brunson a little bit more. Yeah. No, I it's it, I had the same thought not tonight but the 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 previous game where yeah, he come like it, the ball movement was working so well without Luca and like it was swinging in between Dinwiddie and Brunson and they just were getting so many great shots and then Luca comes back and it's again kind of that James Harden esque you know get out of my way I'll ISO I'll ISO I'll ISO and if I want to pass it to you I will and if not I'm gonna just sort of you know dribble into a, a pull up jumper or something. Um, I, I've noticed a little bit of some of that swinging stuff come back. I, I think they are. There is a conscious effort, I think, at least from the outside in, to try to blend the two styles, right? I think yeah. they maybe found something while Luca was out and saying, hey, you know what? Actually, swinging the ball back and forth is actually probably beneficial for our offense. And I actually and, think they reached a lot of places there during the regular season. It's just yeah. it's one of those things about you miss some games and then you come back into it. It probably just takes a little bit of time, but obviously the margin for error against Utah was pretty wide. I mean, we know Utah was fragmenting. They weren't the most confident and connected group coming into the playoffs. Now you go to a Phoenix team who did not look like themselves in the first round. I mean, they kind of squeaked by New Orleans, but nonetheless, it's going to present a much bigger uh, challenge, and that margin for error is going to be razor thin. What happens to the Jazz now? I, th I think everybody feels like this is the end of the line. I mean, we felt like that maybe a year ago um, mm -hmm. under di different circumstances. Maybe this team did decide to make a major move. But to me, it it's just clear that they can't keep running it back with this group of guys. And I don't think it's any one player's fault. I think obviously they're far away from having a lineup that can cover for Rudy Gobert in the ways he needs. I mean, he's a great defender. I think he takes the brunt of, of sort of the blame unfairly. Uh, for this, but you look and say, is he a guy that you're one or two pieces away from building the proper contender for? And if the answer is no to that, maybe you go with the younger player and the younger star, Donovan Mitchell, and try to move mm -hmm. on from Gobert. So to me, um, I think this is the last we will see of this iteration, and it'll be a major change to Utah uh, next season. There's a chance that Donovan Mitchell tries to get out of there too. Um, there is, you know, and so it could be not one, but maybe both stars. I don't know. I mean, obviously, if you have to pick one, I think you have to pick Donovan Mitchell based on where the league is. It's a perimeter-oriented game. He's your younger player. We've sort of seen the limitations of Rudy Gobert. Can you somehow unlock Donovan Mitchell if you had to get rid of one of them? Um, maybe there's something there. But, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely feels like changes are going to have to happen um, within the Jazz organization. And they might not – it might not be completely up to them, right? Like, Donovan Mitchell could ask for a trade. And we've seen that kind of stuff happen lately. This um, happens, by the way, all the time in the NBA. Like the, yeah. Jazz, the Utah Jazz, the Quinn Snyder, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, Utah Jazz are going to be lost to history. They are going to be a <laughs> failed experiment of a basketball team. But I will say, sometimes in basketball, I really believe this, sometimes in basketball it just doesn't break your way. And I think this was a very interesting team that got very close to getting over the hump on several occasions. Right. Of course, the the crazy seven game series against Denver in the bubble. Um, but you know, the ball just didn't break their way a couple times. And you look at it, you step back now removed four. I think this was four playoff runs basically with this group and mm -hmm. um, just not a lot of success there. And it's unfortunate. The best comparison that I've heard for this jazz group are those like Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Deandre Jordan Clippers groups that were coached by doc rivers. Right. And it was just, it was very similar. They just, they were so close, so close, so yeah. close and just didn't have the supporting cast and could never get over the hump. And eventually even though the players are good, the vibes are bad, and it's <laughs> yeah. just and, and you gotta and you gotta try to move on. Speaking of Doc Rivers, the 76ers took care of business and avoided a disastrous potential collapse. But first, let's talk about our friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one source for all of your sports betting stats and information. Find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of Major League Baseball. 
Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sport wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. It's Bet Online where the game starts. All right, let's go to Toronto, where the 76ers took care of business and avoided a dangerous Game 7 with a 132-97 to blowout win over the Raptors to advance to the second round. Joel Embiid had 33 points and 10 rebounds. James Harden had 22 points and 15 assists. And Tyrese Maxey scored 25. The Sixers used a 17-0 run in the third quarter to take control of the game. They'll face the Heat in the next round. But, Adam, what did you make of the Sixers bouncing back and getting the game? I make of it that James Harden finally showed up. I mean, this was yeah. easily his best game. 22 points, 6 rebounds, 15 assists. Um, just controlled the game. And he was a plus 38, a game high plus 38 tonight, which is wild. Just think about that. Plus 38 in a series that had gotten really close over the last handful of games. Um, so he played well and you kept wondering when was it going to come? When was it going to, when, when was he going to sort of show up? This was the game where he showed up. Uh, and as a result, it, it turned into a blowout. And on the other end of the court, the Raptors couldn't make anything. I mean, they struggle yeah. on offense seven to 35 from the three point line. They, it was a bad, they picked a bad night for everybody to go cold. Yeah. During that 17 0 run that basically decided the game, they had missed eight straight shots, which mm. is why they scored zero points. That's kind of what happens, but um you're I, look toronto they don't really have enough shooting they were without fred van yeah. vliet tonight uh and it, i thought it was kind of a matter of time before the fact that they don't have that many great shooters yeah. sort of became a problem for them right like gary trent jr can only be lights you know can only do those things for so long he tends to be a little bit streaky for sure um, pascal siakam gave him good minutes in the first half kind of cooled off in the second half tonight uh it was just a matter of time i thought but um the, the Embiid and Harden stuff, like their their numbers together were awesome during the regular season. They were awesome in the first round. Um, and if James Harden is going to play like that, then the Sixers have a chance in the second round against Miami. If James Harden doesn't play like that, then I don't think the Sixers do have a chance, regardless of Embiid. Um, Embiid looked good, right, with the, with the ligament. Yeah. Like he still had a really nice game. Um, it doesn't seem to really be bothering him very much at all. Sure. So I don't even know if that's going to be a factor going forward for the Sixers. But um, I mean, he really struggled in the last one. I mean, it, it almost reminds you of Chris Paul and that you wondered like, yeah. oh, no, is something going on? Is he, you know, has it, the Raptors figured something out about him? But tonight, you know, obviously he silenced all of those doubts. 33 points, 10 rebounds, 12 of 18 shooting and four of those misses, by the way, four of his six misses came from behind the three point line. So uh, he looked very comfortable out there. The, the 76 er starters did. I will say. Toronto is very good defensively and they're very switchy and they're they're unique. They're smart in their approach. They always have, you know, kind of unique game plans. But the Miami Heat are going to test the toughness of Philadelphia. And to me, that's the biggest question I've had about them right. since they made the Harden trade is, is this a your back's against the wall, we're going to dig deep team? The Miami Heat are going to force them to do that in this series. And I'm curious to see how all of them respond. Joel Embiid uh, quoted after the game as saying, you know, that Toronto was a good first round opponent considering that Miami was their second round opponent because the schemes are so similar defensively. And in that, you know, yeah, both teams like to switch a lot. They have a bunch of versatile defenders who can cover a lot of ground. And um, yeah, in that, and they, they, they like, to, they, they have interesting zones that they'll get into and things like that. So yeah, I think in some respects that's true, but to your point also, like, you know, there's a di big difference between like PJ Tucker and Chris Boucher. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he was that, awesome, by the way, tonight. I can't. Yeah, I don't you're mean using, to like throw Boucher to the him bus, to but slander here when he was incredible. Yeah, I think 19 in the first half. Yeah, to Chris Boucher. Uh, yeah, good. You know, good Boucher series. Good for him. Um, I, the other part of this too is the Heat just came off of a series against Atlanta, in which they completely shut down Trey Young. And, yeah. and I think it's fair to say at this point in their careers, is Trey Young the superior guard to James Harden? I mean, certainly this season he was, right? You're going to, oh my gosh, I can't wait for your, it's your mentions that are going to be on fire when this, uh, when they hear this one. I, Trae I, I Young really like Trey Young, first of all, Trey Young has been fantastic as an offensive weapon. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's not really a slight to James Harden, but it is funny to think about, <laughs> about that, just that idea about Trey Young have, having surpassed James <laughs> Harden in that capacity. I mean, 
you can't really argue against it if you just take the stats for the whole season. Now, we could debate ceilings and who do you trust more in a playoff setting and whatever. The solvability but solvability is the thing I think about it. That's, is, that's is, is Trey more solvable than James Harden is? Even if Trey, to be honest, his peaks right now are, are every bit, if not, they're actually higher than what we've seen yeah. of a peak of James Harden. In the difference years. is that he's not playing with Joel Embiid, who throw right. like as, as far as solvability, yeah, you could right. just sort of throw the kitchen sink at Trey Young. You can't really do that to James Harden. Because right. you've got Joel and Bead popping out the other end here, but still, like the Heat have shown, like like they completely dominated that Hawks series with their defense. If that defense is what's rolling into round two, then yeah, the Sixers are going to have a really hard time with that. They really yeah. are. Yeah. So, um, any That'll thoughts an on the series? I think yeah. it'll be a good one. I really just am excited to kind of see, like I said, the toughness of the 76ers. sixers. I'll be honest. They were starting to splinter, I thought, a little bit last game. And I'm a little bit surprised that they won as comfortably as they did tonight. I always thought they could win. They're the more talented team. But I thought tonight's game would be more of a dogfight. And they came out and, and, and sort of broke this thing open until, to start the second half. Um, but Miami's going to test them. And I, I'm just so excited to see how Doc Rivers responds. I mean, we're 24 hours away from him throwing his previous teams <laughs> under the bus. Um, so I, their, their medal's going to be tested. Yep, yep. Um, all right, last little exercise here before we wrap up. Um, we've talked about some of the really top end players in the first round. We only have one series yet to be decided, Minnesota and Memphis. Yeah. Just quickly, some of your top performers in the first round of the playoffs. Maybe maybe make your all NBA first round team or yeah. or you know. Yeah, this one's interesting. I think the two Boucher guys that, on it. Yeah, Boucher's there after tonight. How could he not be? Um, the two guys that I think are the easiest locks are Jason Tatum just had an incredible series. Yeah. I mean, he had such a good series. People were talking about, did he sort of surpass Kevin Durant in the series? You know, he outplayed him. You yeah. could say he had the better supporting cast, better scheme, better system, all this stuff. But incredible playoffs for him. Jimmy Butler was incredible in his four games. Um, 30 points per game for Jimmy Butler. Yeah. Of course, a lot of that was, was, was it a 47-point game? A 45-point yeah. game, but also tremendous defense, right? I mean, yeah. like, I think he had he had multiple steals in every game he played in that series. It was crazy. I think those two guys are the ones that you look at and say those those have probably been the two best. Yeah. I, I'm going to give the hometown discount here. Jokic is leading the first round in scoring and also has a higher field goal percentage than anybody else in the top 25, which is pretty wild. Uh, I thought he was awesome in that game. series, and I thought I thought Denver would probably extends that series if he doesn't have to go out for those extra two minutes in the fourth quarter. But that we're not. Yeah, we yeah we're, not, we're that. not rehashing that one. I <laughs> he, he struggled the first two games. I thought you know he he was mediocre. He was he, yeah. he was below MVP level. But I thought the three games, and then just to hear you know sort of the way the the Warriors players raved about him after the game was pretty neat. Luca didn't play enough games, but he was pretty special in in yeah. his uh, couple of games, and then. Jalen Brunson deserves a little shout out here. I'll also say Steph Curry, who uh, he his numbers maybe don't pop off, although it's 28 right. points per game, which uh, and 40% on nine and a half three pointers. But that series, when he was on the court, the Warriors were winning almost. He could be our sixth man. Time. He only started one game, so he That's can be true. our sixth man. He, he's coming off the bench for this team. He's the <laughs> sixth man. There you go. Uh, also, Draymond, I mean, he wasn't you know putting up yeah. numbers, but his yep. defense was just unbelievable. So I think he needs to get a spot on this on this first De team. That's now like eight, eight people long, I guess. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> whatever. We make the rules here. Um, not on the list is Kevin Durant. He's he's not on my list. Kyrie, Kevin Durant, not on the list. Kyrie, not on the list. Nope, I'm with you. Not on the list. All right. Uh, Mike Conley not on the list after that trial. Oh, um, oh that, that one hurt. That one, that one hurts even to hear. You it. Felt for him, didn't you? I did, I really did. <laughs> I, I really too. did. It was such a, a, I mean, Mike Conley doesn't turn the ball over. That's his thing. He like walked into a travel. I, it was the weirdest thing I've seen. It was it, bad vibes in that jazz team. <laughs> That's what happens. They seep in. All right. That'll do it for us today. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of locked on NBA, wherever you listen to podcasts for 30 minutes of the NBA's top stories every day until next Friday. You can find me over at locked on heat and Adam is over on locked on nuggets. Thank you for making locked on NBA your first listen every day. Have a great weekend, Adam.